The topic is COVID-19 pandemic and the uh, internal labor, migrant labor crisis in India. Now I request Dr. Z. Vijay sir to proceed his presentation. Thank you. Uh, so to begin with, uh, I thank uh, the organizers uh, of uh, HTP uh, Girls College, uh, especially uh, its principal, Dr. Bipul Chandra Bhiyan, uh, Dr. Palash, uh, Dr. Gokul Chandra, and Dr. Bipul Kumar. Uh, my lecture uh, today would focus uh, on uh, two major uh, uh, aspects uh, of understanding uh, the pandemic, uh, the kind of experience that uh, India has had, uh, at least ever since uh, March uh, onwards. And uh, we would also try and see how the policy has uh, addressed the problem. And we'll try and reflect uh, on, uh, you know, how to really analyze uh, and where really uh, to look for uh, answers uh, and the causes for the kind of uh, crisis that has just been described, uh, you know, by uh, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Vipul uh, Chandra Bhiyan, uh, which is to do with, of course, all that we have been seeing in the media, large numbers of, uh, you know, migrant labor uh, struggling hard to move out of their uh, you know, places of employment uh, to, you know, in a, in a condition of desperation to reach uh, their places of origin back uh, in their villages, uh, along with uh, you know their families, uh, very uh, you know little children sometimes in time babies. Uh, so and it was a tremendous uh, you know kind of a uh, display of uh, miserable circumstances. Uh, and to say the least, uh, we should consider this as a uh, as a certain kind of a systemic failure, a failure of our uh, society and civilization uh, to prevent this kind of uh, you know, miserable conditions uh, being a spectacle uh, you know, globally uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, so, of course, uh, some of the numbers have uh, you know, been uh, snagged off. Uh, these numbers uh, beat uh, you know, the 130 uh, million, uh, uh, odd million uh, migrants. Uh, are all, uh, you know, basic estimations, and this is also one of the major uh, issues in this realm, that we do not actually have uh, systematic data on how many, uh, you know, migrants actually are uh, participants in these kinds of labor markets, how many people have uh, actually passed through these kinds of crises. Uh, these are all mere, uh, you know, estimations uh, that people uh, have. Now, with reference to trying to understand the problem, how do we pose the problem? See, the way that uh, we need to understand this problem is uh, that you have a situation where today, uh, you know, in the, in the more uh, recent uh, uh, time, uh, you have a situation where there is a demand for lifting the lockdown. And there is a pressure being built on the government uh, saying that, uh, you know, the, uh, this lockdown itself uh, could actually uh, be seen as uh, leading to large number of starvation deaths uh, or deaths due to uh, uh, you know lack of um, wages or employment. Uh, now, how do we really understand this kind of a, uh, a comparison of thoughts or that we end up trusting, uh, in a way, the employment or the right to employment as against the right to health? Uh, and how should we really uh, you know, understand this kind of a problem? Because uh, it's quite uh, you know unnatural uh, and quite a, a serious uh, contradiction to pose uh, what is seen as. Uh, yeah, yes. H hello. Is there a problem? Hello. Now you can continue. You can continue. You can continue. Yeah, I'm not, Sir, you can continue. Yeah, so I heard. Yeah, okay. Uh, so therefore, there is there seems to be uh, you know contradiction of thoughts being forced uh, between what is seen as uh, you know welfare uh, in traditional economics and what is seen as well-being uh, in the development uh, you know analysis. Uh, 
uh, and this uh, quite clearly is a very uh, unnatural kind of a contradiction to pose. Uh, that can people really give up, uh, 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 you know, the health uh, or entail uh, risk, uh, you know, of the kind that uh, COVID poses. Uh, we all know that it's a novel virus. We do not actually have any cure for it. Uh, of course, uh, you know, with reference to the death rates. Uh, it has a very low death rate in comparison to several other, uh, you know, diseases. Uh, but the real problem seems to be what uh, the scientists have called the R2 or the rate at which, uh, you know, the, the, the infection spreads, uh, which seems to be much, much higher uh, in comparison to several other, uh, you know, diseases. Uh, and the fact that uh, this rate of infection, uh, uh, you know, itself uh, could pose a serious threat to the possibilities of running uh, you know production systems uh, that the system needs to actually uh, have a situation where uh, we could sustainably carry on uh, production uh, rather than have situations where we end up uh, with cycles of crisis uh, where we have several uh, spells or phases of lockdown uh, which will be a systemic kind of a breakdown so therefore how do we really approach uh, towards that kind of a possibility uh, where the economy and economic activity can be sustainably carried on uh, would be the kind of challenge that uh, you know we would be addressing with given uh, the nature of this uh, pandemic uh, the kind of uh, uh, you know numbers that we are seeing today uh, of course uh, you know with reference to uh, the lockdown decision itself uh, my own view is that it was a very good decision uh, but uh, what ought to have been done uh, through the course of this uh, you know, lockdown, whether we have uh, been successful uh, you know, in, in addressing the kind of challenges uh, uh, that, uh, that would have been posed uh, and so on. You know, these are of course, uh, you know, some kind of hypothetical questions that uh, can be posed. Uh, but more uh, uh, you know, pertinent than that uh, would be to look at, uh, as I said, the causalities of the problem itself as to why do we really have uh, this kind of a situation. Uh, and this is where uh, I would uh, argue that uh, the Indian development scenario uh, poses a certain kind of a peculiarity uh, in comparison to the traditionally or uh, you know observed or rather historically observed uh, you know kind of development and processes that uh, have uh, uh, been uh, you know unveiling in the case of the relatively more developed capitalist economies, uh, with Europe, with United States. Uh, its uh, you know development path uh, in some sense has been significantly different uh, from the path that the uh, Indian uh, development scenario is uh, taking, and uh, this is where we observe uh, that when it comes to analyzing employment, uh, you know development and health uh, related uh, interconnections, uh, we need to understand that Indian economy as uh, it develops uh, usually you know. As I said, historically observed uh, understanding would be that there would be a shrinkage of thoughts uh, in what is uh, uh, you know understood sectorally uh, as well as uh, in the language of employment as the unorganized sector and informal uh, employment. Now, this uh, uh, you know these classifications uh, are extremely important in terms of understanding uh, the structure and the nature of employment as well as the production economy. Now, conventionally, you know, the official data uh, would define the organized sector as a sector which has uh, more than 10 workers, uh, you know, uh, uh, with electricity, uh, more than 20 workers, you know, without electricity and so on. So that's a sectoral, uh, you know, kind of a uh, understanding. Whereas with reference to the nature of employment, uh, the idea of Employment itself being formal or informal uh, has something to do with the idea of social protections. A uh, large number of our uh, uh, you know, workers today, uh, in the, uh, those that are employed, uh, are essentially working uh, in the informal uh, mode of employment. So they, they have temporary uh, you know, work contracts, work contracts which lack basic social protections. Uh, and legally speaking, these are things, you know, basic things like your ESI uh, or your PF, right? Uh, a certain regulation, uh, you know, with reference to your working time, uh, the idea of a claim to accident compensation, uh, and another important uh, interlinked dimensionality uh, happens to be the idea of 
uh, you know, coming from the vantage point of the labor itself, uh, the notion of organized and unorganized uh, are to do with the idea of whether labor have uh, access to union, their own collectives uh, or not. And this is where uh, you find that large number uh, of these informal workers are also simultaneously unorganized, that they do not have access to collective ones. Uh, and that, of course, uh, has a bearing on uh, you know, their own bargaining power uh, and so on. The other important uh, you know, dimensionality with reference to understanding uh, the nature of employment uh, happens to be the fact that a large number of these uh, workers uh, also happen to be migrants. Now, when you address the problem of migration uh, in connection with the process of informalization and disorganization of uh, you know, the labor, uh, you have to uh, basically try and understand why it happens. Why is there migration? Traditionally, conventionally, economic uh, you know, development theory uh, has really adhered to explanations uh, you know, with reference to the idea that there are wage differentials, uh, you know, that it's a, you know, a, 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 some kind of a choice uh, that the workers make uh, on the basis of the returns that they, you know, the net returns of sorts that they uh, expect. And therefore, uh, there is a, a, a choice of people to migrate. Now, with reference to the empirics of it, uh, this notion of migration, uh, which in some sense is a unidirectional migration, that there is a process of mobility from, uh, you know, one region to another, one sector to another, uh, one form or you know one kind of an employment to another uh, uh, you know perhaps between the same sector and so on all of this is motivated in some sense uh, by the idea of an enhanced uh, you know welfare right that the uh, welfare outcome somewhere ought to be positive uh, and uh, until and unless that happens uh, there would not be a rational explanation for why people choose to become mobile or choose to get employed in certain uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 available employment opportunities and so on. Uh, quite contrary uh, to the traditional uh, understanding, uh, in the Indian context, uh, you have a very peculiar kind of a scenario, uh, which is described, uh, you know, predominantly as distress-driven migration. Now, while it is true that, uh, uh, you know, there is a wage differential, there is, uh, you know, clearly the idea that uh, the economic returns uh, you know, with, with reference to the urban uh, uh, or the suburban uh, kind of employment avenues are much better uh, in comparison to what workers are likely to get uh, in their places of origin. Uh, it is also simultaneously true that uh, the choice of actually moving out uh, is actually compelled in some sense by the fact that there are hardly any survival opportunities available to the workers in their places of origin. So in that sense, therefore, uh, and that, of course, uh, is not the only criterion, but also that uh, people, uh, given their, uh, you know, cost of, uh, uh, you know, uh, subsistence uh, requirements, uh, start depending on borrowings, right, to meet even their bare minimum subsistence requirements. And it is this kind of a subsistence uh, gap, uh, which is what is associated uh, in turn with, uh, you know, uh, borrowings, or uh, the reasons why people become indebted systematically to private money lenders or to other kinds of uh, you know such uh, institutions precisely because they do not have uh, you know collaterals uh, to pledge. So these sections of uh, people come from extremely poor background with very little assets. A uh, large number of them uh, you know are also landless labor. Uh, they are small marginal uh, you know farmers, um, and of course socially uh, they belong to. Uh, the socially marginalized groups uh, like the scheduled caste, the scheduled tribes, the OBCs. Uh, so socially they are vulnerable, economically they are extremely deprived, uh, and uh, they become indebted systematically uh, even to meet their subsistence requirements precisely because the incomes that they derive out of the employment avenues that are available in the places of origin are so inadequate, uh, and it is this condition uh, which is what is described as a condition of distress. And when people move uh, under conditions of distress, uh, obviously uh, the nature of the employment, uh, uh, you know, relations that emerge are quite problematic. That you cannot really be looking at several of these, uh, you know, employment modes uh, as uh, ordinary wage employment or wage labor mode. Uh, 
you know, there are several, uh, you know, uh, paths or uh, uh, chains of migration where uh, labor uh, receive advance, advance payments, right? From, you know, there are jobbers and middlemen who recruit these labor uh, and they are recruited uh, on the basis of, uh, you know, some kind of a advance payment that is made by the contractors uh, to recruit the labor. Uh, and when the advance payments are, uh, uh, you know, made, uh, the labor uh, work and they repay these advance payments, which more or less effectively work as some kind of a debt, right? Because there's already money received while the labor has not been delivered. Usually the wage uh, labor market operates the other way around, where the labor is, uh, you know, delivered first and then uh, against which, uh, you know, the wages are received. But here the wage payment in some sense happens, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, uh, in advance. Uh, and until and unless that advance amount is repaid uh, through the quantum of labor uh, 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 which is given out to the uh, employer, uh, the employee in some sense loses the freedom to change the employer. Now, these modes have been described as new forms of bondage associated, of course, with contracts which look uh, very much like the ordinary wage contracts, but which do not work quite uh, uh, you know, uh, as simply as uh, ordinary wage contracts. Uh, with reference to the kind of economic transaction that happens between the employer and the employee. Now, we have observed, uh, for instance, these kinds of labor markets uh, in the instance of the Odisha uh, labor migration to uh, Telangana uh, Bricklin uh, work. Now, Bricklin is also a manufacturing, a manufacturing which is there in the unorganized sector. Uh, and here, if you observe the nature of the labor conditions, uh, you find that uh, you know, the, the uh, people are recruited from the most backward district, the KBK uh, region of Odisha, uh, and brought uh, uh, to uh, Telangana. Uh, and the, the, the working, not just that the working conditions are extremely appalling, the entire system, the way that uh, it operates is quite shocking. Uh, you observe that, uh, you know, uh, in the uh, places of origin, uh, you have village committees, uh, you know, which are headed by, uh, uh, you know, the, the local money lenders, the big landlords, uh, the, the temple priests, uh, as well as, uh, interestingly, the panchayat sarpanches, uh, whose job uh, is to basically try and uh, uh, regulate, in some sense, the fact that if a laborer escapes uh, from the place of destination, from the place of work, and goes back to the village, uh, this village committee has to hand over the labor right, uh, to the uh, employer. Now, why do people really run away from the places of work? Uh, and that, uh, uh, you know, when, when they are receiving, uh, you know, wages in advance, uh, when they are already caught up in a condition of distress, uh, when, of course, this is not a, uh, you know, one-time kind of a contract. Uh, these contracts have been executed for the past two and a half decades. So, therefore, people look to gain, gaining these kinds of employments again and again uh, in every season. These are of course, seasonal, uh, you know, migratory processes, uh, you know, temporary migration. Uh, but then why do people really run away? Because if somebody runs back to the village, their own reputation as a worker is likely to suffer. And then, uh, you know, the, the, the employment opportunity that might come in the next season might, uh, uh, you know, become a problem. Uh, so if you look at it from that perspective, uh, you clearly see that the kind of violence, the kind of uh, working conditions that people experience here uh, are quite brutal. Uh, you know, people are made to work, for instance, from 30 in the morning to 10.30 uh, in the night, close to about 16 hours uh, of, of work. Uh, they hardly have sleep, uh, you know, given that there are also, again, household chores uh, that they, they have to, uh, you know, address. Um, and, uh, the, the, you know, the, the kind of housing uh, conditions. Uh, we, we talk about, uh, you know, Swachh Bharat Mission, if you go to several of these buildings, it's all open defecation. There's hardly any, uh, you know, safe drinking water supply. Uh, you know, people keep washing their utensils for the four and a half to six months uh, that they stay in that working site in the same pool of water in which there is huge quantum of refuse of food uh, that they have been cleaning with the same water again and again. The children with all kinds of skin diseases, several kinds of diseases, uh, you know, in, in an extremely uh, unhygienic circumstances. It is these kinds of circumstances and conditions uh, in which and people, of course, get sexually abused. They get physically, uh, you know, beaten up. 
uh, in even in an instant where they get sick they are unable to work uh, but they have to work uh, you know because the supervisors would say that you have to repay uh, the outstanding uh, quote unquote loan or rather uh, you know the wages that they have uh, received in advance so that gives uh, in some sense uh, a moral legitimacy right uh, so in that sense the civic consciousness of people to resist this uh, is also very low that people do not think there is anything wrong uh, in in somebody beating up a worker in exercise of brutality and violence in case there is something wrong uh, you know on the part of the worker but that's the kind of consciousness that uh, uh, you know this uh, uh, this set of workers operate with it is also extremely important to understand uh, that these networks now be it the unorganized Uh, sector like the uh, you know brickling production or be it, uh, say several other manufacturing industries in the organized sector uh, you know the other side of uh, research that uh, we have worked on uh, is a uh, industrial estate now these are new industrial towns uh, you know several of these industries uh, have been classified as sunrise industries because their production uh, is also oriented towards exports uh, there are uh, you know foreign markets Uh, in which the commodity sell like for instance the pharmaceutical industry um, or uh, uh, there are several other uh, industries which also have uh, large uh, you know national uh, markets uh, you know be it uh, the, the steel manufacturing there are of course traditional industries like the textile uh, of course there are also others like the electronic uh, and so on so a large variety of uh, you know these uh, these industries uh, are in operation uh, in the new industrial towns which also employ large number of these migrant workers also on temporary contracts so most of these workers are again uh, you know hired by the contractors uh, they are of course in, in the case of the organized manufacturing industry advance payments is a is a very uh, uh, you know kind of a minuscule kind of a mode advance payments do not exist whereas in the unorganized sector advance payments are a dominant uh, you know mode of uh, how you uh, recruit a, a worker uh, to work uh, in the manufacturing sector uh, which is in the organized sector uh, you still have contract uh, workers i mean this is temporary contracts which basically means that uh, you do not have an assured uh, employment you ha you have no legal protections in case a worker is removed from a uh, work uh the worker has to simply leave the job there is no a uh, claim to compensation uh, uh, of any kind uh, and in comparison to say uh, the unorganized uh, sector in these sectors uh, you have predominantly male migration uh, you know as as individuals and they stay in groups um, and of course uh, here also you have at least uh, you know a, a minimum day is described as 12 hours uh there are, there is uh, you know a uh, uh, huge uh, work related uh, set of hazards uh, even in in this sector you find in several instances uh, you know that accident compensations are not paid and so on now what is common therefore uh, to the idea of informal employment across uh, organized as well as unorganized sector is that there are no social protection basic social protections uh, are lacking uh, and to that extent therefore Uh, we need to understand why this is happening with reference to the uh, uh, you know the nature of the market and this is where institutionally speaking we need to understand how uh, our ability as a society to face a pandemic uh, you know oh, uh, related to to or uh, 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 i get an i get some voice uh, yeah it's uh, you know they could just mute yeah thanks uh, so uh, so if, if uh, you know we look at it across uh, you know these uh, sectors uh, what seems to be a common thing uh, with reference to uh, uh, informal employment uh, as i said is the fact that there is serious lack of social uh, protection uh, whereas in the development analysis uh, how we have approached uh, say for instance the uh, reforms uh, there was a certain understanding uh you know prior to the economic uh, reforms uh, that the kind of protections the kind of uh, labor market regulations uh, the 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 laws uh, you know the labor laws that exist uh, you know be it several kinds of acts you know the factories act uh, 
uh, you know, be uh, you know the, the kind of acts that talk about uh, regulating the uh, day uh, or the wages. All of these, uh, you know, acts uh, have been considered uh, by conventional economics as problematic. The reason being that they look at uh, the whole process uh, in terms of uh, you know welfare choices. Uh, and all of these regulations in some sense are therefore described as rigidities because uh, say for instance if you pick something like a time uh, you know they would describe that there are measure lovers and workaholics so if you have a fixed uh, you know working day uh, then both these uh, groups uh, are likely to suffer welfare losses because those that are workaholics uh, you know uh, uh, lack the possibility of working uh, for a uh, for, for more time than what is regulated and those that are leisure lovers uh, lose out in terms of enjoying their leisure uh, because they have to uh, you know compulsorily work for what is defined as a working day now given this kind of an analytical uh, frame that we have of uh, trying to say that the entire economic choices are essentially emanating out of individual choices atomistic individual uh, you know utility functions now that is a problematic, uh, you know, considering the fact uh, that how in reality uh, the labor market processes are actually operating. Uh, what is the, uh, you know, distinct mode, uh, you know, which, which differentiate in some sense uh, the real life processes from the analytical frames that we use? Well, if you observe again, uh, both in the unorganized sector as well as the organized sector, uh, most of these informal workers. The way that they migrate is associated not necessarily with the idea of market, but actually with the idea of networks. A large number of these uh, you know, workers depend either in terms of the information flows or in terms of uh, deriving these social protections. Uh, not in the, in, the, in the case of you know, this kind of a pandemic and a shock, uh, which quite clearly is beyond uh, you know, their uh, resources and uh, you know, their ability to cope. Uh, with these circumstances, but in ordinary circumstances, in normal circumstances, also, uh, be it uh, healthcare, be it lack of adequate, uh, you know, resources to meet up certain kind of contingency situations, people do depend on each other because these are all communities that are, uh, you know, that are, uh, you know, moving, uh, and you clearly see that there is, uh, you know, uh, we may say that there is a geographical segregation of thoughts. Uh, you know, when you look at the migration processes, uh, the places of origin and the places of destination are systematically linked. People from a particular set of, uh, you know, regions move to particular kinds of destinations. Uh, and uh, you also find that uh, they move uh, as groups. Uh, there is a caste kind of a, a, a linkage, there's a kinship linkage, there are family ties. Uh, you know, there are, there are, of course, you know, very, very interesting uh, for micro level studies that we have done. Uh, we find that 60% of the information flows uh, happen because uh, these youngsters in the organized manufacturing sector, especially, have studied in the same school. Now, education uh, has a very different kind of an implication, therefore, uh, to how or in what way do they really get linked uh, to the uh, uh, nature of mobility, nature of employment choices. Uh, in our labor markets. Now, when you say that mobility happens uh, on the basis of networks, when you see that uh, you know the paths uh, uh, of mobility are clearly demarcated and segregated, you also find uh, in extension that employment segmentation as well as stratification uh, in some sense gets linked uh, to these kinds of processes. So the markets uh, in the abstract, uh, you know, which we are taught uh, in our in our Sir, sir, your voice is not uh, listening, sir. Please unmute, sir. Sir, please unmute your voice, sir. Sir, please unmute your voice, sir. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying. Okay, sir, now okay. It's okay, okay, sir, now okay. It's okay. No, sir, sir, again, again. Yeah, yeah, I know. I've seen that. I've yeah, seen that. I've corrected it. Okay, sir. Yeah. Okay, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, 
so as i said uh, you know so as i said the, the processes of allocation which happen through networks are quite different from the processes of allocation that happen through uh, relative prices so quite clearly we are operating in extremely imperfect market uh, and these markets therefore also if you look at uh, you know the profiles of these labor uh, there's hardly any serious difference right of sorts in education levels of those contract workers who are working in the organized sector organized manufacturing sector versus those workers uh, who are operating in unorganized sector like the big teams you have large numbers of uh, say people who have never been to schools or people who have uh, only primary uh, you know school level uh, education so educationally speaking which is usually our proxy uh, you know to define human development to understand wage differentials uh, because uh, we we in some sense uh, implicitly assume that the levels of education also have a uh, consequences for the productivity uh, uh, you know and their ability to uh, 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 value add uh, these kinds of assumptions fall flat uh, because we find that the access to different kind of employment uh, technically speaking on the basis of the technical uh, uh, you know structures uh, around the profiles of these labor uh would not really technically speaking be constraints to their mobility uh, into different kinds of employment so what is it which constrains the mobility is actually the network itself uh, and it is these networks which are in turn dominated uh, as i said uh, on the on the basis of uh, you know villages regions class uh, kinship several kinds of social structures uh, you know which mediate uh, the information flows the very access Uh, to these employment opportunities and once you start appreciating the fact that uh, these are peculiar uh, you know social formations uh, through which people actually access uh, employment opportunities then this whole obsession of sorts uh, with the idea of uh, you know relative prices and price based uh, allocations of labor uh, need to be critically assessed and uh, analyzed um, and Uh, if to that extent that for uh, if if you were to really <coughs> talk about uh, the 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 kind of crises that we observe uh, most of these workers uh, you know receive extremely low wages now uh, some of the calculations uh, you know on the basis of the 2008 nsso uh, surveys on temporary uh, you know migrants uh, the average uh, uh, you know wages received uh, was uh, said to be around uh, 6000 rupees in our own calculations uh, done more recently in 2018 uh, we got around 10000 rupees uh, as the uh, average uh, wages received uh, by the workers uh, in the uh, in the manufacturing sector uh, whereas in comparison to uh, the kind of uh, 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 you know the government uh, uh, circular which has been issued on minimum wages uh, we find that somewhere even for uh, c uh, uh, great towns Uh, uh for the unskilled workers uh, you have uh, around 350 rupees uh, as the daily wage uh, sorry uh, around 5 uh, 550 rupees uh, as the uh, as daily wage uh, which has been determined uh, you know by the government and quite clearly you find that there is a massive gap right uh, in the in the in the legally uh, stipulated minimum wages versus the wages that uh, the workers actually uh, receive uh, and this more of actually uh, uh, you know uh, undercutting the wages uh, is very much part of the development process uh, that we have uh, you know come to uh, 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 you know adopt uh, because if you really look at uh, what really gives advantage you know, in terms of the competitive advantage uh, to the uh, uh, several producers uh, even in the organized uh, manufacturing sector uh, it seems like uh, uh, you know uh, that the cost cutting strategy has been the dominant strategy uh, in the manufacturing sector uh, whereas the uh, the strategy of uh, innovation the strategy of uh, you know of factor productivity enhancement uh, has actually been uh, a, a marginal strategy investments in r&d uh, in, in several industries in comparison to the uh, international percentages of uh, investments in r&d have been extremely low so in that sense the predominant mode uh, you know which also happens to be in the msme sector uh, and in the msme sector you have a predominant mode of cost cutting 
which uh, uh, you know leads to the fact that uh, uh, what you can cut uh, is something that you have control over in terms of uh, how you control your cost function uh, and several of the other big machinery or other uh, you know raw materials there's hardly uh, you know any uh, control of sorts in terms of the prices uh, whereas with reference to the price of labor which is wages uh, there can be a control uh, if uh, you know if, uh, you try and ensure uh, that uh, the labor that you are employing is not socially embedded so precisely why migrant labor is being employed uh, in in place of local labor usually conventional economic teaches us that uh, you know uh, employment of labor uh, you know uh, or migrant labor uh, is chosen in case the local supplies do not have those skill sets so that's an assumption which again falls flat that it is not because the local area does not have the skill sets to supply but it is because of the fact that the local people have much greater bargaining power and they have a bargaining power because they have access to the local civil society their own communities they have access to the local politicians because they are voters there and you know that enfranchisement uh, in itself gives them a certain kind of empowerment uh, and they are uh, they have a voice right uh, they can get organized the very idea of people getting organized into unions the fact that their bargaining power is likely to be uh, you know greater therefore uh, in itself is seen more as a liability because it adds to the cost function now this has been the dominant mode of approach uh, because of which uh, the employers have been choosing migrant labor uh, to undercut the wages and uh, you know especially important you know you can look back to solo uh, you know when he describes the efficiency rate hypothesis that if you have massive unemployment uh, you know uh, in the urban pocket which is a fact uh, you quite clearly have a situation where uh, workers cannot really organize you can organize only if the spells of unemployment are low uh, uh, and uh, there is a very little risk right posed by the fact that people might be thrown out of their jobs so in that sense therefore uh, you have a circumstance where collective action is constrained by the extreme insecurity uh, that is posed by the condition of distress because there are outstanding loans that they have to repay so therefore these jobs are like uh, you know uh, jobs to which uh, they survive Uh, and in the uh, you know working environment they have no voice they are unorganized and therefore they have to accept uh, you know whatever comes as part of the uh, employment contract it is these circumstances because of which uh, you know when people have been thrown out of their jobs uh, uh, you know uh, uh, there is hardly any commitment on the part of the employer or rather institutionally speaking on the part of the market to help the workers cope Uh, with the circumstances that they found themselves in now what is it that the state has done now the labor ministry has uh, you know sent out a certain advisory the advisory is that uh, you know despite the fact that uh, 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 you know labor is not being performed large number of uh, you know production units have been shut down because of the uh, you know uh, the pandemic uh, the wages nevertheless must be paid the mind you this is not a regulation this is not a legally enforceable uh, you know kind of a mode uh, it's an advisory in a labor market in the unorganized and the organized sector where you have informal employment you find several instances where wages are not paid even after getting work done contractors cheat workers uh, and there is uh, you know default of payment there are other kinds of you know very interesting modes uh, like for instance because there's not much of time i cannot get into all the detail uh, but i can uh, you know give out uh, uh, you know uh, instances where wages are paid uh, uh, you know not on the first of the month which is what you usually expect if you are a middle class uh, you know secured uh, uh, you know kind of an organized sector worker uh, but wages are paid on the 15th or the 20th of the coming month the reason being that uh, you know in order to ensure that there is an assured supply of labor see the worker if the worker finds that the working conditions are extremely appalling uh, he might choose to leave right at least in the uh, organized uh, uh, sector employment even if it is informal and unlike the between work uh, so they may choose to leave but to ensure that that doesn't happen especially under circumstances where there is a 
uh, you know greater demand in the market for whatever commodities they are supplying they need an a short supply of labor and of course uh, you know all these skills that the workers uh, acquire uh, is in course of their activity there's no training uh, in which the uh, you know the factory invests there's no formal training that the workers have these are all learning by doing on job uh, you know kind of training that workers pick up these skills so uh, to lose out a skilled worker to replace a skilled worker is certainly uh, you know it involves such costs that are certainly challenging and to circumvent that uh, what the contractors have been doing is that they, there is a delayed payment of the wage so you pay the wage 15 days 20 days uh, you know into a month uh, then in case a worker wants to leave work he would have to leave the 20 or 15 days of uh, you know wages of that month he will get the wages of the previous month or if he works for the rest of the month he is not likely to get the uh, wages uh, uh, you know uh, on the first of the next month either this is the kind of structure uh, you know that they have uh, evolved uh, so also is the case with uh, you know other kinds of uh, uh, you know influences that the contractors have say for instance access to uh, groceries access to groceries uh, because people do not have cash uh, with them uh, they access uh, groceries on credit uh, basis the credit uh, basis uh, transactions are in turn mediated again by the contractors because you have to have some kind of a pledge that there will be payments made uh, for the groceries that the workers have purchased these systems in some sense have brought in certain forms of uh, extra economic controls right on the uh, workers by uh, the employers the very idea of having a contractor itself uh, you know is is essentially to uh, evade the legal liability by the principal employer because the contractor is for all legal purposes shown as a firm as a firm that is employing for another person but the principal employer there uh, technically becomes a contractor himself uh, and that's a, a legal manipulation which is done Uh, by big industries also to evade the liability of the fact that they are not paying minimum wages or the fact that the time regulations you know all these uh, several other social basic social protection esi cf and so on all these protections being violated well that's the mode that uh, you know industries uh, seem to have chosen so therefore what we uh, find is that this cost cutting strategy clearly has created a circumstance uh, where Uh, market doesn't really honor basic contracts, and the state in turn has uh, been actually uh, deregulating, uh, you know, contributing further uh, to, in a sense, uh, intensifying this insecurity because it adds to the competitive advantage uh, to profitability, uh, and therefore it acts as an incentive. The questions that we need to ask today is that in the circumstances that we find ourselves. you know in the, in, the, in the wake of this pandemic where large numbers of workers uh, are unwilling to stay in the places of work find themselves you know uh, their conditions unsustainable that they cannot pay rents that they cannot have uh, you know minimum access to incomes uh, to meet up even their food requirements the bare minimum living conditions uh, uh, you know uh, are also not there this uh, connects to what is uh, uh, usually termed as the a debate around subsistence and subsistence uh, the economic development uh, links in some sense to the nature of political economy the very idea of arrival of civil society right even in classical debates uh, i will uh, you know flag off uh, you know two very interesting texts uh, which are referred to in classical economy uh, you know when you are debating uh, mercantilism you find that Uh, to the course of because there was also a pandemic in the 14th century in europe uh, there was a babunic plague babunic plague wiped off uh, almost half of europe's uh, you know population following which uh, you had the introduction of the poor laws uh, you know creating circumstances for poor people to uh, you know survive of course that came from uh, the traditional uh, you know hierarchical uh, authority of the Uh, aristocracy where the aristocracy was seen as the patron uh, you know that uh, the aristocracy had the responsibility of taking care of its uh, 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 they were hardly citizens they were uh, you know populations uh, as if they were uh, uh, you know their their subordinates or uh, 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 you know 
like for instance if you own pets uh, you have a responsibility or moral obligation to feed your pet it is something of that kind it's a asymmetric relation uh, but there is an obligation uh, on the part of the feudal uh, to basically take care of somebody who is loyal uh, to the authority and it is on the basis of that kind of a patronage system that you had the promulgation of the four laws cos the christian uh, you know uh, ethics around humanitarian uh, you know approach also contributed to the fact that uh, there were these kinds of four laws promulgated uh, but when the four laws were promulgated uh, the mercantilists were up in arms there was a, a treatise on business and trade which was an anonymous document which was published uh, you know uh, by the mercantilists uh, which went on to argue that uh, poor people should not be given these kinds of arms of course the extension of this uh, went on to become the malthusian uh, you know, theory which uh, all of you would be aware of uh, so what this argument uh, essentially uh, uh, meant to say was that the poor people if they are given food uh, would tend to become lazy uh, you know they would uh, uh, try and uh, become you know in the, in the more conventional contemporary language free riders right trying to uh, 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 you know survive on these crumbs first so what should be done is that these people must be sent to work houses or rather what are described as horror houses so there has to be uh, a kind of labor uh, which these people have to be uh, you know made to uh, perform uh, uh, in these horror houses such that the choice is uh, you work uh, uh, you know uh, in these horror houses uh, for several hours you know as some uh, i did you recollect that it's about 18 hours is what is described uh, there so 18 hours of work and then you get access to the poor laws you get access to food if that happens then of course you will be motivated to search for employment otherwise there is a disincentive uh, you know to search for employment if there are free transfers so this was the kind of logic which was developed uh, you know by the mercantilists uh, during this era now against this there was another important uh, you know text called the britannia language uh, which was also again uh, an anonymous uh, document uh, which made a counter argument and these people were uh, essentially nationalists you know quote and quote they said that if we are nationalists uh, we must believe uh, because of course those were the times when you also had colonial regimes colonialism was quite a common thing invasions of territories was quite a common thing Uh, the britannia language argues that if you were to really uh, uh, you know completely drain out your own populations to a point where in order to you know accumulate because after all the mercantilists were engaging in international trade they were also looking for competitive advantage labor was a major component that contributed to the production of course you had the labor theory of value precisely for that reason that labor was such a significant you know component in the production of value Uh, and therefore whatever undercuts the cost of labor would give you a price advantage in the international markets so that was the kind of uh, you know channel that the uh, uh, the treatise on business and trade took as against that uh, you know the britannia language argued that if you were to drain out your populations make them sick uh, you know starve them uh, then if suppose another nation invades your nation how would your population resist what kind of strength would your population have now this was another mode to then say that look uh, look at your own population as uh, an asset uh, as a, 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 you know a, a valuable wealth and that is how uh, you have this kind of an understanding uh, which connects eventually to the notion of citizenship nationality uh, where development itself becomes people centric so you have two different paths that are available to us Uh, we seem to have chosen a path uh, which uh, explains why we are caught up in this kind of a deep mess uh, of sorts where we are today talking about this kind of a paradox about the choice between uh, should we be opening up uh, should we make uh, you know and people are also desperate they are also looking for livelihoods they are looking for employment avenues uh, so the idea that the income wages bare minimum subsistence on one hand and the idea of how do you really protect health how do you protect your community or public health uh, and it, this is where again uh, public investment uh, into health sector that has been another uh, you know major challenge uh, today 
the reason why we have not been able to do what we ought to have done as i said you know in the beginning of my lecture to the course of this lockdown what should have been done uh, to the course of this lockdown was systematic and large scale uh, you know testing why were we unable to do these tests why were we unable to systematically create uh, you know situations where we knew uh, you know where the disease is uh, and systematically you try and uh, isolate uh, you know those groups of people such that uh, you bring bring the pandemic under control a simple example uh, would be you know people are talking about uh, uh, the air travel right now in the air travel you have certain set of rules being promulgated saying that the middle seat has to be empty right there has been a massive uh, pressure that the uh, airline sector has uh, uh, put on the uh, government and for the certain relaxation that have been made to this rule saying that well if you are a same family or if there is too much of uh, you know pressure uh, from the demand side you could relax some of these rules but think about this if suppose you do systematic testing of all the patients if you are very sure that none of them is covid positive you could have an aircraft uh, you know filled with people all the seats can be filled there is no risk uh, you know that anybody entails if you were to conduct the test so is the case with your production uh, you know systems so is the case with reviving the entire economic activity there are nations that have succeeded in plugging the problem uh, since we did not have adequate kits since we did not uh, you know gear up uh, uh, to having adequate capacity and that also has happened over the years because of continuous uh, you know lack of uh, uh, adequate investment into uh, uh, you know public health uh, we find uh, you know that uh, one of the major uh, 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 texts here uh, which is to do with the uh, assessment of the uh, national health uh, we find that the average investments uh, of of lower middle income countries uh, throughout the world Uh, has been over two percent, right, into uh, health. Uh, uh, whereas in case of India, it has been hardly one percent. And this kind of a systematic deprivation. Not only that, but how we have moved uh, into a regime uh, which depends heavily on insurance, right, uh, and which means that we are basically trying to uh, 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 extremely depend on the private sector, like in, in the United Andhra Pradesh. and it continues now we have what is called as the arogya shri program and the arogya shri program went for the bpl uh, you know households works through the mode of private insurance and corporate hospitals and there has been a starving of sorts uh, of funds for the uh, public uh, uh, you know health system the public health care systems there has been no recruitment of you know doctors and other health care professionals for a long time so quite clearly uh, you know we we are lacking the kind of infrastructure and the capacity to take on the kind of challenge that we are posed today uh, by the pandemic and a combination of these factors uh, uh, is what has led to the kind of we have merely postponed our crisis it is not that we have uh, <clears throat> been able to uh, you know circumvent the crisis we see suddenly that the numbers are piling up uh, the the rate of these numbers is growing right we don't really see where the curve Uh, is likely to flatten uh, forget about uh, you know reducing the curves uh, of of either the new cases uh, uh, you know or or uh, the, the deaths and so on so therefore the the crisis uh, that we face today and how we have treated our own migrants in this context that not only have you failed to really give uh, health care uh, to these migrants at the place of uh, you know work when they wanted to return uh, you have treated them uh, you know with with uh, the utmost uh, you know undignified kind of treatment on the borders of their own villages that they were sprayed with disinfectants of course the who has given out uh, again uh, a certain circular saying uh, that spraying of these disinfectants is no guarantee of uh, avoiding or preventing the uh, spread of infection because if you merely spray it doesn't really uh, lead to a situation where Uh, uh, the the virus is likely to be get uh, you know gotten rid of off. so therefore you 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 no way prevent these infections but these practices in some sense uh, seem to mimic practices of untouchability uh, of of the kind of discrimination that have been there uh, for several uh, years in the uh, in the villages uh, and it's it's that kind of stigma uh, that you observe 
uh, has been practiced against these kinds of people uh, and compare it say for instance again what the kind of treatment that several foreign return uh, you know migrants have received uh, there was hardly any reg regulation there not even uh, you know a, a, a compulsory quarantine uh, the, and you know people have attended parties uh, so much so that uh, uh, even uh, uh, you know uh, very important uh, uh, political functionaries uh, and state representatives their health uh, was brought into risk because of the fact that Uh, these people who came from the foreign countries, who were elites, uh, were not actually regulated uh, the way that the migrant labor are being regulated. Today, you find people escaping from the quarantine uh, the center, uh, hiding. Why? I mean, if the conditions are good, uh, if if the life is uh, uh, you know not not so horrible, why would people run away from a certain facility which is after all to protect their own health? Quite clearly, you know there is dumping of people, a massive crowding there. There is actually a situation where people are feeling threatened that if their health is, uh, you know, better, it might actually worsen, uh, and therefore people are perhaps choosing to run away uh, from these facilities. So in that sense, therefore, the overall, uh, you know, development process uh, we observe uh, has increasingly uh, led to a situation where uh, we find this kind of a Artificial contradiction uh, between welfare and well-being becoming, uh, you know, quite uh, understandable, quite rational and reasonable from the point of view of subsistence of workers, from the point of view of the anxieties, uh, you know, that the uh, production uh, system, especially the self-employed, would have. But this is something that we have created for ourselves. It's a crisis that we ought to have been able to uh, see coming. Uh, we never anticipated this kind of a massive pandemic, but in the light of the pandemic, also, what has been our approach? Have we really uh, taken stock of our, you know, this long drawn experience uh, of, you know, from March to uh, uh, until now? Have we really reflected adequately on the policy measures, uh, on the kind of development model? Well, partly yes, uh, because today, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the relief package. Uh, that the finance minister has announced uh, our focus in some sense has been on the msme sector uh, which is where large uh, you know employment is generated uh, but of course it has been in a mode of merely giving out access to loans access to credit facility that's a problematic right because we understand that under normal circumstances perhaps this kind of an approach would have been a very good approach but we are caught in a Situation of a double whammy. The MSME sector has had an extremely adverse uh, kind of an outcome uh, when uh, you know we resorted to demonetization in the first place. Then again, you have in the second phase this pandemic. So two major hits or shocks uh, that our production systems have received. Uh, it's very difficult uh, to expect uh, that mere access to Credit facilities without a collateral is likely to be an adequate incentive for the uh, uh, you know micro, small, uh, medium enterprises uh, to try and revive themselves. The other major uh, you know challenge uh, of sorts also happens to be the fact that some of these uh, you know basic definitions uh, uh, you know have been changed. Right, you have uh, major changes being brought to the basic definitions of what is a micro, small, and medium enterprise. The uh, uh, you know the uh, Bank of America has an assessment that large industries uh, are likely to perhaps take over large number of smaller uh, you know plants assets. That's one trend right that uh, 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 might be uh, seen. Is actually one of the uh, speculations or uh, expectations which have been constructed. Now we know that the large uh, sector uh, industries uh, which also fall in the ambit of this definition. Although they are being called as, because uh, you know, if you, if you look at uh, the fact that uh, 20 lakhs as in uh, sorry, 20 crores as the investment uh, and uh, 100 crores as the turnover, these kinds of definitions, uh, in essence, are being uh, uh, put into competition with those uh, uh, you know traditionally part of say something like a cap of 25 lakhs. So an industry with 25 lakhs has to compete. With an industry uh, which has an investment of uh, you know 20 crores, 
a quite an asymmetric competition when you have a certain upper limit of 3 lakh crores right uh, as uh, perhaps the loans that are likely to be given out so this asymmetric competition in itself uh, would have a very different kind of structure right with reference to access to these loans and what is its impact in turn on employment would we have uh, you know a large number of employment opportunities uh, would it really help uh, enable to create some conditions yeah i am getting some disturbance some voice uh, yeah uh, so so therefore uh, the point that i am trying to make is whether we we succeed in reviving employment whether we succeed in reviving demand uh, under conditions of extreme recession that the economy is currently facing would and uh, you don't have to really go uh, you know further than keynes uh, and keynesian understanding uh, of the psychology of uh, either households or, or the private uh, sector with reference to how uh, or whether or not they will be inspired to invest under circumstances where they do not clearly see uh, that their inventories are likely to be cleared there is no potential demand uh, that you are generating and corporate sector itself has been voicing for this they are saying please create demand uh, please uh, you know resort to certain uh, uh, you know policy measures where uh, we have revival of demand uh, and that uh, you know has somehow uh, uh, not happened until now uh, you know some quantum of money now has been Uh, put into the nrega uh, but given uh, you know the the data uh, as it is there have been uh, there has been a massive uh, kind of scarcity of uh, resources uh, to run or to execute the kind of demand that already exists and this quantum of money uh, might also not be adequate enough you know to to uh, uh, create uh, adequate demand or meet uh, the kind of requirements of the uh, people uh, uh, you know who who are uh, caught up in this kind of a circumstance of a uh, shock related uh, unemployment uh, so therefore uh, you know my uh, uh, point uh, would be that uh, perhaps there is much much more that needs to be done uh, much greater reflection on the development model itself uh, that needs to be uh, you know taken uh, care of both with reference to the nature of employment uh, with reference to the kind of uh production for the other uh, major uh, uh, change has been with reference to this idea of protections being back again that we have gone back in some sense after our neoliberal rhetoric right uh, in the classes in the policy circles in the media circles we are today talking about protections uh, for our own local producers we are saying that uh, any contracts right which are less than uh, or uh, you know around 200 crores Uh, you can't really be calling for a foreign bidding right that quite clearly is not part of the uh, uh, globalization rhetoric uh, you know the allocational efficiency you know what competition could do uh, to welfare and so on quite clearly there is a serious rethinking but that rethinking uh, it seems to be partial it is not really uh, uh, as yet inclusive of the large uh, you know sections of masses Uh, who are actually caught up uh, in the crisis today, and how uh, these supply side initiatives would connect in turn, in terms of including these large sections of people, uh, would remain uh, an interesting uh, kind of a question to uh, investigate further. So this is where I'll stop. Uh, I'll take questions. Uh, you know, if, if there are any. Thank you. sir uh, please uh, mute or un uh, one time you just mute and again unmute sir yeah okay. sure. okay. okay i've done that yes yes okay now it Okay, you continue, sir. But I, I'm done. I'm saying that if there are any questions, I'm willing to take. 
sir uh, you have some questions uh, uh, after finishing your speech i will give you the question sir i'll take on the question uh, question session sir yeah i'm i'm done with my lecture so you can you just uh, you know start, yeah 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 so you can you can uh, start the question and answer session okay sir so thank you very much uh, dr vijay sir for your nice and illuminous presentation uh, i now like to put uh, some questions uh, first question uh, asked by mary philip she asks sir do you think this pandemic has exposed the vulnerability of all sections of society or and has forced us to rethink about the relevance of division of the masses into haves and have nots yeah well yeah in a sense uh, that is true but uh, you know one peculiar uh, thing that has happened uh, in this pandemic uh, see usually whenever we do uh, uh, vulnerability analysis uh, we assume that the vulnerability of uh, an individual is dependent on the socio economic uh, embeddedness so the uh, 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 you know the more disadvantaged one is with reference to their socio economic location the greater is their vulnerability the implication is the greater uh, is the challenge of resilience to cope uh, with an adversity now this kind of an adverse shock like the health shock that we uh, see today uh, we find that uh, this cuts across uh, you know classes usually if you have a climate change uh, or any kind of a, a, a disease you know usual kind of uh, epidemics that we have uh, poorest of the poor or women or certain social groups uh, become more vulnerable right than those uh, you know that have uh, assets and resources or uh, that have a certain status and uh, you know social position but here is a situation where uh, the pandemic uh, in essence has cut across all these class uh, you know barriers the prime minister of britain is as vulnerable uh, the, the the spanish uh, you know princess has died uh, you have several uh, you know uh, celebrities actors cricketers uh, uh, you know all kinds of sportsmen uh, several kinds of these uh, you know elite personalities uh, who have been also affected by the pandemic so in a sense uh, the idea is that cutting across uh, you know these class and that is precisely the reason why uh, in development analysis uh, when you say that uh, like for instance if you talk about the insurance markets in in the in the, in the, in the realm of health economics how do we analyze uh, you know health we have analyzed health by you know, asking the question whether that's a, a, a you know to simplify the problem if an old man uh, is to be operated upon how do you basically uh, uh, you know come to a conclusion to your economic analysis as whether or not it is meaningful rational for you to really operate upon this diseased old man or not how is this decision made well we are taught that well that decision needs to be made uh, by asking the question what is the lifetime that this old man will have uh, after the operation and within that lifetime what are his earnings so what is the economic value you associated with that post operation lifetime whether that economic value exceeds the economic value that you are investing in terms of the cost of the operation if that value does not exceed then which means that there is no net welfare gain so therefore uh, you you are not supposed to be investing on the operation of the old man this is the kind of economics that they have been taught so just imagine that if uh, health were to be treated like a private good and if you were to really leave it to the market and the relative prices to determine the allocation of the health of course there is scarcity no no doubt that there is a scarcity in every resource but this kind of an approach does it really satisfy the kind of requirements uh, you know in, in order to face up to a pandemic like the condition that we are faced with today so if you have several kinds of epidemics uh, you know several kinds of other uh, you know infectious diseases which have not been addressed take for instance tuberculosis take for instance malaria take for instance diarrhea large number of poor people have been dying so it never concerned us because these are poor people I and mean, their voices are never heard uh, you know their their lives are not seen as valuable 
because in economic terms that loss uh, is not seen actually as a loss uh, that calls for an urgent uh, uh, you know uh, redress whereas here is a circumstance where you have a systemic failure our entire production system has come to a halt and today therefore you are concerned the whole uh, you know uh, industry sector uh, is extremely uh, caught up in an anxiety as to what will happen it's therefore that you are trying to address the health problem otherwise maybe you would have precisely how our public health systems have got to uh, uh, you know face so much uh, of reckless uh, kind of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, lack of adequate investments why have we not really cared or bothered about about preserving the quality of our health systems precisely because those serve the poor people and here is a circumstance where we require those systems we don't have them and what do we do now the whole economy is taken so therefore your development model should not really be geared only to the very short run kind of Gains. Certain notion of a development uh, is there for these kinds of contingencies. We don't seem to have. Therefore, I agree uh, that this is a time when Huh? Uh, who gave out uh, a, a long lecture on how suddenly we realize that while the lockdown was on uh, it is after all our uh, uh, you know healthcare workers uh, it is these workers who basically take away uh, you know uh, all the refuse uh, uh, you know the the, the 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 sanitation workers right Uh, the vendors on the on the, on the street these are the people who have helped uh, you know society survive uh, these are not high value uh, you know uh, economic activities no they are not but but their their value is to be assessed in terms of how they address need and, and when you realize that needs matter uh, and uh, and economic value uh, perhaps uh, uh, doesn't make much sense under circumstances where you are struggling to survive then you start valuing and looking at uh, you know these kinds of Uh, activities differently, not merely on the basis of the uh, you know relative prices, the marginal values, but in terms of how they address the necessities, the needs uh, of a society. This is where we need to perhaps rethink. The other uh, you know uh, instance I can think of is the New York mayor who is suddenly uh, you know telling us today that as uh, you know New York was becoming the epicenter of the pandemic, and the question as to who gets access to the personal protection equipment and the testing kits how should they be distributed there were other uh, you know states which were willing to pay more right uh, in in price terms they were willing to pay more they were getting access to the personal protection equipment and the uh, uh, you know testing kits whereas the necessity of these kits uh, the testing kits as well as the equipment was to new york So the New York Mayor is saying, well, the relative prices is a very bad way of allocating this equipment, uh, you know, and the testing kits. There is a need here. We need to really get access. What happens to your relative prices and the efficient allocation, uh, you know, kind of models uh, when this is the circumstance where uh, you know those that have been at the helm of the neoliberal model today are saying that, well, the relative prices more. Uh, of of efficient allocation don't seem to really help us address the pandemic and the crisis so that's that's the kind of rethinking uh, that is on but it doesn't seem to really have affected uh, in any significant way our usual kind of thought processes in the discipline i hope there will be some critical thinking uh, you know down the line Uh, sir thank you sir uh, can i put another question sure sir sure. as many as okay. you want to no, <laughs> okay 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 uh, another question put by mr mridul setia 
uh, he want to know that as the uh, reverse migration occurs what will be the different sectors where where there will be chance of getting job and what will be the role of the government initiative program for employment generation now are the uh, I mean, is the question focused on the international reverse migration or the internal no no internal sir internal yeah well see uh, this again is a sorry you were mute again yeah am i audible now yes yes yeah so uh, yeah so as i said uh, you know i was i was trying to explain that uh, this point also connects uh, very similar to similarly to the way that we have been uh, you know building our uh, development model uh, uh, you know economic analytical model uh, on the basis again of uh, you know relative prices and uh, you know relative value added on the basis of which Uh, our budgetary allocations clearly have had a bias towards the urban towards the industry and the service sector right uh, and we have uh, you know seriously neglected uh, the rural sector investments and today uh, we have a circumstance where large number of people are again uh, moving back uh, to the villages uh, because that is where their social protection uh, is that it is after all the communities Uh, upon which they depend for their uh, you know uh, protection they think that they can survive in the village whereas the urban area that they have been serving for uh, you know throughout their life perhaps a uh, large number of youngsters are also there of course uh, but several of these people have been working for two three decades but they have not been assimilated into the urban pockets they still get seen as outsiders they will forever remain outsiders because the identity of the outsider and you can go back to solo again this whole construct of the insider and the outsider well this is the mode through which uh, you are alienated you are disempowered and that is what influences the relative prices the costs now this kind of a, a, a scenario uh, which is artificially constructed and that is where uh, your entire uneven development model uh, you know comes into play that indian economy uh, is not an economy uh, you know like in the case of Uh, say europe the classical spoke about a subsistence wage right uh, which meant that there could be some imagination uh, of a wage below which no worker in the entire economy would be willing to work but here is a circumstance where extremely backward areas like jharkhand you know you have odisha you have eastern up you have madhya pradesh uh, now these are the places uh, from where large number of labor migrate and they migrate to the most developed pockets maharashtra gujarat uh, you know here uh, in telangana and andhra pradesh uh, now and of course you know kerala pockets of uh, you know tamil nadu wherever there are uh, industries you see these uh, you know migrant labor streams right ending up there this massive unevenness implies that the cost of living in your place of origin and the cost of living in the place of destination there's a massive differential however will you arrive at you know some notion of a social average now this kind of a uh, of a condition where you do not regulate uh, would that be a very intelligent mode uh, because on one hand you have deprived the rural areas of investments uh, uh, you know uh, of development of infrastructure uh, of uh, you know what happens to public schools for instance what are we doing to it in the name of outcomes based education today you are closing down several government schools you are you know what is the kind of uh, uh, conditions therefore you are creating for the middle classes to go and settle uh, in the peri urban or the rural areas without any uh, you know access to the amenities which usually a quality of life expects how do you expect people to uh, uh, you know become dispersed uh, and how do you expect development to percolate so therefore there are development faults there are extreme uh, you know differences and massive backwardness in some pockets there is massive growth pole uh, in the other pockets and this kind of an asymmetry is an asymmetry uh, which created uh, you know the, the the scope for this kind of a mobility of millions and millions of people 
going and settling in urban pockets without actually getting absorbed as citizens without actually getting the identity of also being locals and that kind of a circumstance uh, is a circumstance that uh, is structurally driven and therefore uh, if today there is a reverse migration uh, i don't know if you can really call it reverse migration because this is a shock this is an intermittent uh, you know feature what is a reverse migration is the international migration because you have no possibility of returning there because be it you know the nitaka kind of regulations or uh, you know the the prohibition today that trump has uh, enforced on h1b visas you have no possibility of getting back to those countries so that's a reverse migration here is a situation where it's a shock related return uh, and the returnees would ultimately have to come back to the urban pockets and that's the confidence capital has in terms of neglecting uh, you know these workers where else will they go how else will they survive uh, you know they have to come back so irrespective of all the misery that people have passed through they will have to come back and uh, these are the only survival opportunities that they have this is the kind of confidence uh, you know that capital is today uh, exhibiting uh, which of course from a civilizational point of view from the notions of civil society democracy rights uh, dignity of uh, you know work uh, social protection uh, it's a, it's a grave kind of a, a condition uh, and it's a very very uh, you know bad model right uh, to pursue in terms of uh, uh, how we accumulate how we build our gdp uh, if, we are, if if we become wealthy and our people become poor they become far more deprived more miserable lacking access to precisely what we see today in the united states a richest country uh, you know which uh, has the largest number of deaths why it has hardly thought of uh, you know investing in public health systems uh, it has uh, you know this uh, homelessness uh, you know even food uh, security issues Uh, are there in the united states everything has been driven by the market it has become a market society and uh, you know i suggest for those of you who are interested in understanding this a scholar by name polanyi uh, who has uh, a, you know a, a fantastic kind of an assessment uh, about how we tend to really imagine every resource to be a commodity and then eventually we find that there are fictitious commodities community cannot be a commodity life itself cannot be a commodity earth and nature uh, you know cannot be a commodity several uh, commodities in the public realm cannot be commodities money itself is uh, not actually manufactured in the private sector it is after all controlled uh, you know by the government so therefore there are several such economic entities uh, whereas the more we insist on having a model which works only and only on the basis of relative prices is a model that is bound to fail therefore so the kind of neglect that our rural areas have seen the kind of neglect that the marginalized sections of the society the poor have seen today is the kind of challenge uh, uh, you know that the pandemic uh, has brought to surface that how do these people sur you know survive uh, are you in, uh, you know where do they get their employment avenues from because uh, the agriculture itself is seen as a return off uh, kind of a sector uh you know the the non farm rural activities are of low value uh, they are valued only to the extent uh, that they form the backward end chain supply uh, to the uh, urban pockets uh, otherwise they are also written off you're saying that uh, the people need to find alternative employment these are not sectors which are productive well this this kind of an imagination is a problematic on the other hand you have the post keynesian analysts who are saying that Uh, look you have your supply side kind of biases your your analysis in terms of allocations uh, today you know we we talk about skill india program right uh, we talk about uh, access to capital and so on whereas large number of activities actually require low resources and they are low skilled activities uh, this is a predominant uh, you know mode in which production happens and when that uh, is the nature and the structure of your economy in order that you create circumstances or incentives for scaling up of production right for creating incentives for the producer to invest more what you require is volumes of consumption as volumes of consumption increase go back to your classical uh, economics again the division of labor uh, was the essential internal uh, kind of economies that the uh, uh, production systems which have low uh, you know capital intensity or low level of technology try to uh, uh, you know take advantage of to derive economies 
economies of scale uh, are related to uh, economies derived out of volumes of consumption when there is massive demand therefore that is how you try and uh, uh, create circumstances of uh, increasing the scale uh, of production so therefore if this is the link then there is an organic link uh, between the potential domestic demand right uh, that we have of all these miserable people and the production systems and the kind of economies that they might uh, enjoy uh, in the unorganized as well as organized sector low valued uh, you know production uh, which actually caters to subsistence requirements of large number of these poor people whereas our aim has been always uh, towards the high value end uh, you know kind of the it sector you know the biotechnology uh, you know the financial sector those is high value uh, they're all export driven they're all aiming at external markets uh, and this quite clearly has been at the expense of ignoring uh, you know our own needs our own people and this is the uh, you know real problem with the development model and somewhere if you can bring back this organic connect that large number of our people are not to be seen as a liability but their assets and how do you convert them into assets uh, is is the uh, uh, you know it requires a certain rethinking on the development uh, you know front in terms of the policy approach that we need not really mimic or imitate uh, uh, you know the northern uh, hemisphere we have to have our own uh, you know kind of a imagination of uh, you know development which connects this massively large potential domestic demand to the potential possibility of expansion of domestic production and that needs to be done uh, in order to address the problem uh, the problem of reverse migration also sorry the return uh, of the migrants cannot be addressed unless there is a change in the focus uh thank you very much sir uh, i think although some other questions these are all related questions which we have already answered so uh, okay. thank you once again i now request uh, dr gokul soikia the head and chairperson of economic forum hpp girls college to make his uh, concluding remark about the webinar dr soikia sir it's uh, the mic is yours Gopal Sikar sir are you audible am i audible Gopal da hello i think oh. he yes, yes, yes sir am you can say yeah, yeah, yeah. hello okay okay Gopal da yes you no. you can speak audible no no am i audible now you are audible Yes, yes. You can speak. Okay, okay. Very nice, very nice. So, dear esteemed participants, I really we have very sincerely listened our kind deliberation from uh, Vijay sir. Uh, so, uh, from our organizer sides, as well as from the college family, economic from the likewise. I would like to thank our Vijay sir. Really, Vijay sir has explained the interested labor migrants problem in these pandemic situations. Sir has covered almost all the aspect uh, the interested labor migration problems. I think in a perspective of development economics, uh, which is very much lucid and. in set pool i think and we know that due to this pandemic situations multiples or a million of migrant labor they have displaced they have been displaced they have lost their workplace the workplace is shut down due to the imposition of lockdown and what the millions of workers had to work back to the native place or the home now the question is that what is the solution and that solution should come for this type of discussion of webinar and our muti sir i think has elaborated uh, in detail 
basically he also explain the causality in between the employment and the between the which is very much important basically in informal sectors also he has covered the situations in both formal and informal sectors but this due to this interstate basically labor migrants displacement but they face they face very severe hardships in both the manufacturing as well as constructing uh, construction industries or of course they are also facing sometimes brutality which is very much concern uh, for us people and another question is the what will be the labor subsistence sir has uh, also mentioned so what very much uh, uh, nicely and also lucid letter informal information network system in our market through which mobility happens now this pandemic situation has uh, lessened the mobility and they because they have to come back to their native or home place in this situation social structure is a very much important factor i think and which uh, is affecting uh, information network which uh, in where the kinship plays a very much important role as well as we should also think about the why should the actually labor migrants and here we can mention the uh, one great economist uh, uh, ideas that is a luis he is mentioned that the surplus labor or the in as uh, labor working in informal day uh, what they have to migrate in another sectors or in other states only for their what prospective jobs for higher wage employment but in their native places they get a lesser wage and they have to negotiate they have a lesser bargaining power so in that case what our liability of principal workers or principal employers is very much important so i have mentioned these things so in these situations uh, how can we solve this interested market uh, labor migrants crisis it is a very important question sir has lucidly explained now we should uh, suggest i think some uh, solutions because they have already uh, come back to the native place how they will be absorbed in different sectors in the native places in both formal as well as informal sectors uh, first i i, I should uh, say one thing that the interested workers they should be first registered in the native places maybe in the ground plan sites or maybe in the municipal areas or maybe in the corporations and they should be provided the benefit of the pds system the public distribution system so that uh, they can uh, they can so that they, they, they don't face any sustainability they don't face any uh, survival questions and in this case uh, uh, they should be granted they should provided the facility of the, i think displacement allowances like this Uh, home journey allowances because they have come back uh, they have faced severe hardship they have lost their income food sort uh, sort this as well as the what uh, ultimately livelihood livelihood and they have also they don't have a suitable uh, residence accommodation in this case the government should <coughs> think about that how they can be they could be provided a suitable uh, residential accommodations in this perspective or in this context we could actually refer to what uh, labor a uh, minimum wage act in case of india so especially in uh, which was enacted in 1948 in that is sir uh, uh, many more questions are there but in a very nutshell uh, i would like to uh, conclude and just uh, i would also li uh, like to of our sincere thanks to our organizers really the iqc coordinator polak and the as well as our secretary economic from uh, dr bipul kumar rava and our principal sir dr bipul sundar bhuya uh, for uh, extending their sincere effort and cooperation kind cooperation for this uh, webinar and i do hope that in future we do also 
uh, able to we have been we will be able to organize such type of um, uh, webinar that would help our academic uh, uh, academicians and other social activists social workers and that will uh, pave the way for the resolution of this interested labor migrants crisis and uh, now and what should we do after this post uh, covid 19 situation that is also a question with these few words i would like to offer uh, to our secretary bikulaba or kola hendrik thank you thank you sir uh, thank you uh, thank you uh, dr gopul sokia sir uh, the president as well as the head of the department of economics uh, now the last agenda of the webinar that is vote of thanks i i am going to offer the vote of thanks session uh, first i would like to offer our sincere gratitude and sincere vote of thanks to our respected uh, resource person of this today's webinar dr z vijay sir i was very much fortunate that uh, three years back myself and my dear colleague monjit had an opportunity to attend a refresher course with uh, dr vijay sir uh, he has excellent command about, about this uh, the, about the field of various socio economic uh, sectors of uh, sector uh, socio economic issues he is not only a good teacher but also a good social activist we can say uh, today's deliberation gives us immense knowledge in uh, in particular aspect of this uh, internal labor migration which is occurs because of this pandemic situation i again on behalf of our college fraternity as well as department of economics is uh, offer our sincere gratitude to dr vijay sir and i hope in near future also doctor we will uh, make uh, uh, co uh, cooperation as well as well, collaboration with sir in other various special different aspects i hope uh, sir will definitely help us in near future i also thank our principal sir with his busy schedule he deliver his uh, inaugural speech in a very lucid and clear way uh, i on behalf of the organizers also thank uh, dr bhuya sir I also offer our gratitude to my fellow colleague, Dr. Gokul Soikia, sir, uh, our head as well as the chairperson of Economic Forum, HPP Girls College, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Bipul Kumar Abha, uh, the secretary uh, of Economic Forum as well as assistant professor of Department of Economics. And I also offer my sincere gratitude to all the participants. Uh, those are actively participate in the whole session and give their valuable feedback. Although various uh, participants have put their questions, but I cannot take all the questions because of the paucity of time. And Sir has already elaborately explained all the things. That's why I beg a pardon for all of you. And I hope in near future you will help with us. And I also thank Mr. Sumit Sarma our assistant coordinator of IQC, who uh, take the uh, technical part, which is the most important part uh, so far as the webinar is concerned. Uh, he very sincerely uh, handled the technical part. That's why we can uh, complete this webinar in a very successful way. And not uh, last but not the least, I will thank all the uh, uh, fellow faculty as well as the uh, employee of our college for their active support to conduct this seminar and i just uh, want to announce that we, we will have a series of uh, we will have a series of webinars uh, from today onwards from 27 again we have a seminar 28 29 and 30 we have a webinars uh, so i with this word i would like to conclude my vote of thanks piece and now i can uh, declare i want to declare that the webinar is over Thank you. Thank you very much. Meeting for Thank you. Thank you, sir.
मीटिंग क्लोज करिए क्लोज है मीटिंग क्लोज हेलो हेलो
Thank you. 